Is it okay? Do you, you wish to put them like this? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, today we have uh, got a really nice guest who traveled uh, from far away, all the way from Vienna by train. <laughs> Not so far, but <laughs> still uh, significant travels. Uh, yeah, so Pablo uh, is a PhD student at the University of Vienna, but what he's going to talk about is uh, his previous FDR project. Um, uh, yeah, so he will tell you about himself, and I don't have any departmental issues for today. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Katarina, uh, for inviting me and for the introduction. I'm Pablo, and I'm going to talk here about uh, uh, dung beetles, Amazonian dung beetles, and about the ecological drivers of diversity, the functional structure of the community, and also about a case from a species that is very important for its ecological role. So a little bit about me, I did my bachelor's in biology in Spain, then I spent some time as a research assistant in the tropics, and that's why I decided to do my master's degree in biodiversity of tropical areas and conservation. After finishing my master's, I went to Peru to work as a field researcher, a data analyst for Amazon conservation in dung beetle ecology. And nowadays I'm doing my PhD in the University of Vienna, studying cacao and pest control by birds and bats. But I'm gonna focus in this period of my work. In, and yeah, I'm gonna talk about, about uh, the dung beetles here. So the structure of this presentation First, I'm going to introduce the dark beetles and say what are they and why you should care about them. Then I'm going to talk about the place where I was working in Los Amigos Conservation Concession in Peru. And then we, well, I'm going to start about uh, the river meanders and how they drive down beetle diversity. Also, how can Different sampling methods reveal hidden functional diversity of the community. And lastly, how uh, Coprophaneus lancifer, that's one of the species with which we were working, is playing a huge ecological role in terra firma Amazonian forest. So, first, to start talking about dung beetles, dung beetles are uh, uh, beetles, Coleoptera, from the subfamily Scarabena, and they are like the hummingbirds of the arthropod world. Why? Because they have huge number of species with different colorations, morphology, and they depend on a resource that is constantly being renewed. This, this is or done or carrion, but there are some exceptions, so beetles that are specialized in other resources. And lastly, they play a huge ecological role and provide ecosystem services. For example, they, uh, they play an important role in bioturbation and nutrient cycling. They input nutrients into the soil through dump removal, and this has an effect on plant growth. They can also play an important role in pollination. It's not an important compared to other insects, of course, but there have been cases of uh, dung beetles pollinating plants. They also uh, uh, do secondary seed dispersal. They disperse the seeds that are in the dung of vertebrates. 
and they bury them because they bury these balls they make. So they promote the, the siblings and they can influence in other organisms moving or changing the abiotic condition of the eggs. For example, dung flies that lay eggs in the dung can be uh, affected by dung beetles because the dung beetles are moving their eggs and changing the abiotic conditions. They also uh, are predators where there are some species like, the, like this Deltophilum valgum that have been reported to be a, a specialized predator of milk peas and uh, also play an important role in parasite regulation for the same thing that happened with the dung flies. They are uh, moving or changing the abiotic conditions of soil parasites, and this has an, an effect in parasite regulation. Um, finally, they reduce volatilization of uh, greenhouse gases, burying the dung. They, they keep these uh, compounds in the soil and they avoid them to be transferred to the atmo atmosphere. They are also important ecological indicators and they have been used to study, for example, forest regeneration or uh, the impacts of hunting and also other impacts like ecotourism here. So they are an important group of the arthropod world. Uh, about the place where I was working, it's called Los Amigos, uh, Concepción para la Conservación and Biological Station. It's in Madre de Dios, Peru. And this is an important area of the planet because it's in the Amazon and have a huge diversity. So it's very, it's an important place in, ter in terms of conservation. And it's, this is, well, this is the station in which I was working for seven months. I was living there. Um, yet the habitat, sorry, the habitat is composed by terra firme and flood plain forest. Also, there are some permanent swamps and uh, seasonal swamps and other habitats like uh, river banks and sensational habitats that I'm gonna talk about. And it's a place with a, a huge mammal diversity and abundance. Um, this, of course, is important because they are the main producers of downbeat uh, uh, resources. And this is the first part of the presentation. I'm going to talk about how river meanders shape the down beetle community. And um, the river meanders are these curves that the river make that are constantly changing because these curves makes uh, well change the speed of the water flow. And in the curve itself, the water flow is faster, so it causes erosion in one bank and sediment deposition in the other bank. The sediment deposition creates new land that is colonized by pioneer species, and these species are uh, succeeded by other species. And at the end, what was once river can be a mature forest. They also create this Oxbow Lake. And as you can see, for example, here, there is a beach well, where it used to be forest. Now we have a river beach. And this is all because the physics of the water flow. There is a successional um, forest succession in these habitats. As I say, the pioneer species are colonized, are replaced by more forest mat mature forest species and this change the this is, this have an effect on the micro di diameter and the height of the species in that part of the forest and thousands of years of this phenomenon have uh, end up creating the two main amazonian habitats that are terra firme and flood plain forest if we uh, scan the forest with a LIDAR, 
we are going to see that there are parts that are above and parts that are below. So all these blue parts have been eroded by the river. And there is a difference of, of 70 meters height between the two parts. And these uh, river meanders have been changing uh, soil nutrients and by that productivity and plant community, what end up having a cascade effect on riches and, and abundance of other groups. So we can find differences in a small distance, like in 50 meters and 70 meters height, we can find big differences in plant and other organisms. Uh, this is the associational forest about uh, I was talking. So from the river to the mature forest, we see an increase in tree height and tree uh, crown diameter. Here we have first the river that is colonized by canes or pioneer species. And these are succeeded by uh, early succession species like uh, Cecropia trees. Then we have a, a part of a young forest that is a late successional forest with other species that have replaced Cecropia. And at the end, we have the mature forest that have big trees. And this also uh, causes a change in the, the story temperature because uh, the big trees uh, create more shadow, uh, more stable temperature in the mature forest and instead in the beach where we don't have trees, the temperature is quite high. So knowing this, we wanted to study how does the down beetle uh, species richness and abundance change along the gradient and also the community composition. And if these changes are driving by species replacement or by the gain on, or loss of a species from one habitat to the other. And also we wanted to study how does the maximum critical temperature of the species change between habitats. So uh, with this purpose, we sample in four different transects in flood plain forests and one transect in terra firme forests. We sample the habitats I was talking about, beach, uh, pioneer forests uh, that I'm calling canes, Cecropia forest, young forest, and uh, flood plain and terra firme mature forest. Uh, we did an habitat characterization measuring different variables like uh, tree height, DBH, and leaf litter depth, and uh, other habitat structure variables. And we use baited uh, pitfall traps to sample dung beetles and also place temperature data loggers in each habitat and perform some uh, thermal tolerance experiments in 13 species that are specific of each habitat. So these are the pitfall traps and the results of the pitfall traps. And these are the thermal tolerance experiments in which we were increasing the temperature and measuring the temperature of the beetle with a thermal camera. So what we found, we found 108 different species in uh, 13,700 individuals. The sampling coverage was good. It was equal between habitats. So what makes the habitat comparable? And um, we found that the species richness and abundance stabilize along the successional gradient. In the beach, we found the less uh, amount of species. And in the Cecropia forest, we found no significant difference between Cecropia and the other habitats. Uh, same for the abundance. So we, we found that the species richness is stabilizing. But the community composition uh, did change between habitats. Uh, as a result of an NMDS and a permanova analysis, we found that the habitat itself is explaining uh, for 54% uh, of the vari variability in the dance beetle community, and that's quite a lot. 
uh, about the community composition also, we found the highest uh, species turnover between terra firme forest and the other the successional habitats. Although the uh, beta diversity wasn't the biggest in terra firme forest, we performed an analysis comparing these results of beta diversity with null, communi null communities with the same species richness and found that uh, terra firme forest differs significantly from the other forests uh, and their uh, random distribution of the species scenario. We also found that the river bridges uh, are home to the most different species assemblage. We found the biggest beta diversity results between a uh, river, uh, between the beaches and the other habitats. And we also found that the beaches are home to two species that are almost exclusively found here. Um, that are very important, are called Gronfa saurucrinosa and Pantonidia rubromaculata. And these uh, results make the river beaches um, an important habitat because they hold the species that are not found elsewhere. And this is important also in terms of conservation because in this part of Peru and in most of the Amazon in general, River banks are being are threatened by gold mining. So the gold mining is destroying the river banks and leaving only stones. And these species that only live there can be threatened by these activities. Also, gold mining causes an input of mercury to the soil and to the water that can be uh, having an effect in the survival of these species. In terms of uh, tol uh, thermal tolerance, we found three groups of habitats according to the uh, data logger data we collect. And these are the beach, the successional habitats here uh, named Cañabrava and Cecropia, and the mature forest. So we found difference between beach and mature forest, but not between beach and, and successional, nor between successional and mature forest. So we measure the thermal tolerance of 13 species and found big differences between the species in terms of uh, critical temperature. And we wanted to, uh, well, we classified the species according to the preferred habitat. We selected the species that were formed mainly in successional or in beach or in, in the mature forest habitat. As you can see here, these are the beach species that are the two that I talked about, Cartonidia and Gromphas. And when we compare the thermal tolerance of the species according to their habitat, to their preferred habitat, we found differences between the beach and the mature forest and the species at a beach habitat that prefer beach habitat have an estimate of uh, 5.7 degrees uh, higher critical temperature than the species in the mature forest. So some take home messages about this very part is are that uh, damp beetle species rich in an abundance stabilized along the associational gradient, but the community composition keeps changing when, what makes uh, important to preserve successional habitats as well and not only mature forests. And the city max of the species decreased along the successional gradient. It was uh, lower in mature forests and this makes these species more vulnerable to deforestation because deforestation, when you remove the trees, the temperature increase in the understory. And these species are not adapted to these changes or to these high temperatures, so makes them vulnerable. Also, uh, we found some specific species in the river beaches that can be threatened by artisanal gold mining because of habitat destruction. 
So now I'm gonna talk about the second part of the presentation. That is how can we uh, reveal functional diversity using different sampling methods. Um, uh, when we sample arthropods, the method decision is important because using different sampling methods, we are gonna find different results. For example, we can find different results in the number of species, but also in the community composition of the species. Oops, uh, yeah, in the community composition. They also, it also even uh, small uh, modifications of the same sampling methods, in this case, pitfall traps, can have different results, both in terms of species richness and community composition. And this has an effect, an ultimate effect, in functional diversity estimations, because if we are detecting different parts of the community, uh, our results of functional diversity can be different, are expected to be different. So we wanted to test this with dump beetles, and the dump beetles are readily sampled with uh, baited pitfall traps, like the ones we used before. These are baited with dung or carrion, and these are quite effective. But there are also some species that are not attracted to these traps. For example, a previous work in the in Los Amigos Biological Station found a great number of species that were not trapped with the pitfall traps, traps but with uh, FIT traps. These are flight intercept traps. So this part of the community may be overlooked if we use only pitfall traps. And so what we asked ourselves here is does the use of different sampling methods increase the number of dump beetle species detected in the assemblage? And uh, if so, do these species contribute significantly to the diversity at different orders? Uh, we wanted to test this at uh, the level of Shannon diversity and Simpson diversity, Shannon diversity or Q, Q uh, equal one. Uh, gives this uh, gives a proportional weight to the import, to the species according to their abundance, and uh, Q equal to each Simpson diversity or the inverse of Simpson diversity gives a higher importance to the more abundant species. So if we are sampling only rare species with the additional methods, these two indexes are not expected to change. And lastly, we wanted to test how different sampling methods affect, affect the functional diversity estimations, as we knew that this could, if the community change, the indexes of functional diversity may change as well. So we use five different sampling methods, uh, three of them use bait to attract the beetles. These are uh, dung and carrion baited pitfall traps. We also placed some uh, traps, dung baited bottles at four meters height, because we knew that there are some species that are living in the canopy and are mainly uh, attracted to monkey dung. So we wanted to take into account these species as well. And we use two sampling methods that do not use bait. These are the flight intercept trap that I mentioned before, and visual transects that were done by two people in one meter, uh, 100 meter uh, belt. And we, we did four repetitions. Uh, each day at sunrise, noon, sunset, and midnight, because the other traps were placed for 24 hours. So we wanted to catch this difference with the bell transects as well. <coughs> we placed uh, 44 sampling units per method in terra firma and flood plain mature forests only. We didn't sample successional forests here. 
And we also make sure 25, uh, function, uh, 21 functional traits to characterize or to calculate functional diversity. 16 of these were morphological related to resource uh, location, mobility, science, um, interaction between the species and the environment. And uh, we also use five ecological traits related to dial activity, habitat preference, diet and resource relocation. These traits were uh, transformed to a distance matrix. Uh, we calculate the distance between the species in the trait space using uh, goers distance and perform a principal coordinates analysis to calculate the uh, species trait space in four axes. Uh, some statistical methods we use as we were comparing different methods, it was tricky to compare them because the sampling effort was different. So we equal the results to a reference sample size of uh, 2,720 individuals. And we did this by uh, pooling the species assemblage found with each trap. These are done baited people traps, carrying baited people traps, uh, bottles, FIT, and belts. So we pull these uh, individuals who found with each trap, then extracted uh, these 2,720 random individuals by a bootstrap procedure. <clears throat> and calculate mean species richness and the functional diversity indexes. Which are these indexes we use? We choose, we choose uh, the functional richness, that is the complex school volume of the functional trait space. And this is calculate, was calculated using four dimension. Here, there are only two dimensions shown but we use four because it was the base number according to the analysis. Uh, we also calculate the functional specialization. That is the mean distance between each species and the very center of the trait space. And lastly, we use a functional originality. That is the mean distance between the species in the community and their nearest neighbor. So functional originality is telling us how different are the traits of one species compared to the, to the closest one. So how unique are these traits? And functional specialization is telling us how uh, different are the traits of a species compared to the other traits of the whole community. So uh, we found in these experiments, we found 103 different species in almost 5,000 individuals in total. And we saw that uh, uh, dunk baited pitfall traps and FIT and belts were sampling some species that were not found in the other methods. The carry embedded and bottles were also sampling I know some species that were not found in the method, but in a lower amount. And just to mention that the FIT traps found uh, 64 species in one fifth of the individuals uh, trapped with uh, dump baited pitfall traps. So it's a big difference. In one fifth of the individual, you have uh, almost. 90% of the species found in dunk baited traps. We saw that some of the species accumulation curve were not stabilized, but the sampling completeness was similar between methods, what makes them comparable. And according to the species richness for a big sample size, we found that the combination of FID traps, of dumbbaited traps, sorry, with other sampling methods increased the number of species. So these are the, the species found with the dumbbaited traps and the complex interval. And found that, for example, 
the combination of FIT and down betty traps always increase significantly the number of species detected for a reference sample size. So we found in the same number of individuals, we find more species if we use FIT traps in combination with uh, the dunk bedhead pitfall traps. Uh, we also found that the additional species that were detected with other sampling methods were contributing significantly to diversity at other orders at uh, Shannon diversity and Simpson diversity. So these are not only rare species that are finding very low numbers, but these are species that can be abandoned, but are not detected, not attracted to dunk bedded traps. And for the functional diversity, we found that the additional sampling methods increase the volume of the functional trait trait space. If we use only uh, pitfall traps, long bedded pitfall traps, we are gonna detect only the 83% of the functional trait space. But if we use them in combination with the flight intercept traps, we can increase this percent percentage to the 93%. So we are detecting uh, much uh, higher functional richness using FIT traps than using FIT traps and down baited pitfall traps than using only the pitfalls. Uh, according to the functional originality results, we found that uh, carry on baited pitfall traps we're increasing the functional or originality of the detected assemblage a lot. So we were finding a species with unique combination of traits in the carrion baited pitfall traps. And uh, according to this uh, functional specialization of the community, uh, happens the same, the carrion baited pitfall traps were detecting a species with unique combinations. So this caused an increase in functional specialization as well. But if we consider the, the axis, the range in which, in which these values are moving for functional originality and functional specialization, although the difference where, although we found significant difference with pitfall traps, the effect size of functional originality and specialization are very low. So it's significant, but it's not too much and maybe not uh, very important. So some uh, conclusions about this uh, second experiment we performed we found that complementary sampling methods detected more species and this increased uh, other diversity metrics uh, apart from species richness. So these species that are overlooked using the traditional sampling methods are contributing significantly to the diversity of the assemblage. We also found that functional richness is underestimated using uh, pitfall traps only. And uh, we will detect only 83% um, of the total functional trait space volume if we use this type of traps. But if we use them in combination with uh, FIT traps, we can increase this percentage uh, to a 93%. So we will be detecting almost all the functional trait space volume if we use only two sampling methods. Uh, this has a consequence in the environmental impact assessment that use down beetle as ecological indicators. Because if we sample down beetles only with the traditional methods, we are gonna detect only a subset of the community and our conclusions 
about environmental or anthropogenic impacts will be biased to that part of the community. We will not be considering the whole community. And the other part of the community that we are not considering might be affected by these impacts in a higher or in a lower amount than the part that, that we will sample using baited pitfall traps. And also, yeah, the combination of the baited pitfall traps with FIT will be a, a good idea if we want to have a better representation of our community and the functional diversity metrics. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about an uh, important species we found in the Dan Fitzel assemblage. This is Coprophanaeus lancifer. And uh, it's an important species that plays a huge ecological role in the terra firme forest. And it's important because it's a functional rare species. And what does this mean? A functional rarity. Uh, functional rare species are species that have unique combination of traits that differ from uh, the traits that we can found in the rest of the community. For example, in sharks, the whale shark is very, it's a shark that is completely different of the others. It's huge, it's, it's uh, so plankton. So if we plot the functional trait space of sharks, we are gonna see that the whale shark is very distant of the others. And these rare, fun functionally rare species are more likely to support function that cannot be delivered by the rest of the community because this uh, combination of traits makes them unique and makes them play a different ecological role. So to talk about Coprophanalus lacifer, it's the largest Amazonian dung beetle is huge actually, uh, and super cool. Uh, it's distributed along the whole Amazon basin. And uh, its abundance is not high, but for the size could be considered uh, abundant in the wet season, but is completely absent during the dry season. We never catch uh, a coprophanous lucifer in the dry season. And also the abundance is much higher in terra firme forest than in floodplain forest. Um, if we uh, plot the trade space of the community, considering Lancifer, we are gonna see that Lancifer is always placed at the vertices of the trade space, is this red point we see here. And if we remove Lancifer of the community, we are gonna see that we are losing the 23% of the trade space volume. So we are losing almost one, well, one species represents almost the, the one fifth, not one fourth of the trade space. And this is because it has a unique combination of traits that is increasing this volume. These parts of the volume of the trade space are not considered if we remove Lancifer. So this is what makes uh, this species a functionally rare species. So we wanted to, uh, is, this is not about Lancifer, but we had an experiment in which we wanted to characterize the necrophagous arthropod community in the mature forests and see which were the main arthropod groups involved in the, in the decomposition of medium-sized mammals for what we use uh, guinea pigs that are, are very abundant in Peru. They are uh, used the, to, well, they are breed, and they eat them a lot in some parts of Peru. So it was a resource that was easy to find. Um, we wanted to study how 
the abundance of this group change through the day and over time since the appearance of the carcass. For that, we place guinea pigs that we bought in different parts of the forest and use time-lapse camera with close-up focus and uh, take one photo every 30 seconds and analyze how the community change along these uh, gradients of time. Uh, we found a lot of mammals stealing our guinea pigs and <laughs> other vertebrates as well. But we also found something that was uh, very cool and it's kind of sensitive, but we found huge amounts of lancifer coming to these guinea pigs. Here we can see 13 lancifers at the, at the same time. And what is even cooler is what they do with the guinea pigs. And I have a video for that. I'm gonna do it because I couldn't include it in the PowerPoint. It's almost one gigabyte. No, it's one gigabyte. But this is a time lapse video. This is a time lapse video of three hours. Well, it's 30 seconds, but represents three hours. And what we found is this. Basically, the lancifers bury the albinic in three hours. Um, it's maybe kind of a cooperative behavior because we saw a lot of them at the same time. So maybe they are, uh, I don't know, cooperating to bury the guinea pigs. And this is something that wasn't described yet, so it's quite cool. And make us change our questions in this experiment. So a part of the other two questions we have, we added other uh, two additional questions. Um, these are up to what size the uh, Lancifer can vary carcasses. <laughs> and does this size vary between floodplain and terra firme forest? Because we knew that Lancifer is more abundant in terra firme forest, and we saw that they may be cooperating. So if there were more Lancifers in terra firme, they may be uh, could vary bigger carcasses. And also, we wanted to study uh, the vertebrates and lancifer competition because we found a lot of uh, guinea pigs that were taken by vertebrates, but also a lot of them that were buried by lancifer. And we wanted to study how this competition uh, changed between the two habitats. So the first part of the experiment was to characterize the community. We use different uh, groups. We couldn't identify two species level in the pictures, but we identify to family level or order sometimes. We found uh, three different families of flies. We also found a lot of termites and cockroaches. And we here the bars are colored according to the abundance of the species along the time since the placement of the carcass. So the first 24 hours are the lighter colors, and then the colors are getting darker with time. So for example, we found that the cockroaches were more abundant in the after. Uh, 72 hours or after 48 hours since the placement of the carcass. We also uh, 
monitor these other groups first, uh, Lancifer, of course, and uh, other down beetles, Eumastacidae, that is a uh, Orthoptera family, and some Hymenoptera like wasps, bees, and ants. And uh, we found that the different groups show different activity patterns. For example, if we see the, we look at the flies, we can see that Mesembrinellidae and Califoridae, these two families were mainly active during the day, but Sarcophagidae was active mainly during the night. And kind of the same thing happened with the, Platodea termites were active mainly during the day, but cockroaches were more abundant during the night. And for Lancifer, we saw that they were um, mostly present uh, during the evening, during the late afternoon, and the beginning of the night. And about the comparison between between terra firma and flood plain, we saw that of the 16 guinea pigs we placed in terra firma, 11 were buried by Lancifer, so that's a 68%. And of these 16, the 37% were buried in the first 24 hours. But in flood plain, this number is much lower. We only find from two SP, two <clears throat> guinea pigs that were buried by Lancifer, while 10 of them were taken by vertebrates. And the time since uh, the, since deployment, the time when we detected Lancifer for the first time since deployment was much lower in terra firma, 45 minutes, because they are more abundant there. Um, we found them in the medium after 24 hours in flood plain. So these differences in abundance may be causing these results. So we run some logistic regression models to model how the probability of being buried by Lancifer change uh, depending on the weight of the guinea pig and the habitat in which it was placed, and how the probability of being taken by a vertebrate change depending on the weight and the habitat as well. And we found that the probability that Coprophaneus lancifer barry the goose was much higher in terra firma forests than in flood plain forests, while in the floodplain forest, the vertebrates were the one winning in this competition. They were taking the carcasses before uh, before Lancifer. And we also find that we also found that the size of the kui of the guinea pig that were buried by Lancifer varied between the two habitats. So in terra firma habitats, they were burying bigger guinea pigs, while in loop plain, when a pui was uh, almost 500 uh, uh, grains, it was not, not possible for them to bury it. And this may be because this cooperative behavior we saw that in terra firma, as they are more abundant, they can bury bigger cuis, bigger guinea pigs, sorry. Um, but we found that this interaction was not significant. If we check the confidence, confidence interval, it looks this awful. And we think, well, I think that is because we need to increase our sample size and um, that's what the people in Peru is going to do during this wet season. So we are expecting to have better results, more complete results, and be able to describe this interaction uh, nicely in a paper. So knowing this, could we consider Lancifer as a keystone species in the terra firma forest? Well, first of all, it's creating a great bioturbation effect 
varying such an amount of uh, meat and it's creating a nutrient input as well and is limiting the access the access to the carcasses to medium sized carcasses to all the other uh, scavengers or even to flies that deposit their egg in the carcasses so they also burying the carcasses they facilitate the access to soil organisms and they that can be benefited of these nutrient inputs and they change the abiotic conditions of the eggs that are laid in the carcass before it's buried. As we saw before, the uh, flies were active mainly during the first 24 hours or maybe the first uh, 48 hours. So these flies are deposit depositing eggs in the carcass the first 24 hours, and then Lancifer is burying those eggs. So it's changing completely the conditions, and this may be causing that these eggs are gonna die, or maybe it's gonna promote the hatchling of the eggs. We don't know what is happening here, and that's one thing we would like to study too. So to conclude with this uh, last part of the presentation, we saw that the temporal segregation of the arthropod co necropolis community is visible even at order levels. So if we go to family uh, or to species level, it's going to be higher for sure. We saw as well that a lancifer is playing a huge ecological role as it is burying up to 70% of all the carcass, the, all the medium sized uh, animals that are dying in terra firme forest. And uh, it, lancifer also interacts with other organisms and change the abiotic conditions of the eggs or limit their access to the carcasses. So we, if we think that this phenomena is happening at a huge scale in the whole Amazon basin, we think that this species can be considered as a keystone species. So to finish with the talk, the main conclusion I wanted to synthesize everything in one phrase is that dung beetles are creatures that perform important ecological roles and have a great impact on other organisms. And this impact and the diversity of dung beetles may be sometimes overlooked using traditional sampling methods or focusing our sampling in the mature forests or predominant habitats. Uh, yeah, that would be all. I want to thank uh, Amazon Conservation and the International Conservation Fund of Canada, of Canada for uh, giving us funds for this experiment. And of course, the whole team that uh, have been working in Peru for a year and a half, or for almost two years, collecting all this data. Uh, thank you for your attention. So how often does the floodplain forest get flooded? Uh, it depends. It should be every wet season, but it depends because sometimes when we have a climatic phenomena like El Niño, La Niña, the precipitation change and we have higher floodings. But other uh, years with drought, we, the floodplain is not flooded at all, but should be every year during the wet season. Because I'm asking just for fun, it was just on the ground larvae. So probably the forest gets flooded the larvae, larvae ground, right? So this might yeah. be one of the reasons why that the bump is there. It, it might be, but also we we found these two species, Cantonidia and Grompas, that are uniquely found in the beach, in the river beach. Mm -hmm. 
And we don't know how is that possible because of what you are saying that the beach disappears every wet season. So we we didn't found them in other habitats during wet season. They will probably have shorter flowers here, but that's smaller, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. But we don't know what is happening with them in this in these seasons, yeah. But yeah, you could just be slimy how long it survived after water. We tried to <laughs> we tried to breed a uh, ground fast, but it was a disaster. <laughs> but yeah, it could be a cool idea. Yes. Uh, in the second chapter, you had this table with the um, yeah. species that were caught with uh, the different kind of traps. Uh -huh. So, and I think in the FITs you had um, this. Yeah, we had these species for which the specialization was yet unknown. So could it be that most of these species also prefer carrion instead of dung and therefore were not caught in the beta traps? Mm, no, because they use carrion traps as well. Okay. Well, this is not uh, these are not our results, but from an experiment that was done in the two thousands. And they use carrion traps as well. And all these species are basically classified as unknown because they were only capturing uh, FIT traps or hand collected. So they were not attracted to any bait. And they didn't know which resources are they using because none of the baits, they use different type of baits like fungi, fruits, or uh, milk peas. Um, none of these species were found in baited traps. That's why they classified them as unknown. What type of dam do you use? Uh, I was expecting this question. Uh, human dung, mainly. Um, also, we tried with other kind of dams because we were collaborating with a rescue center. So we tried with monkey dung, uh, tempir dung, uh, jaguar, and a lot of different so things. Is that you have, for example, different on yes. yeah. in the private sense of the and this is the species that is not attracted to omnivore or predator down. This one? Yeah. It's like those large black ones yeah, yeah. are mostly attracted to all the herbivores. So maybe you might have, you have an ally with the tape here. Mm -hmm. Then you have dendrophyamon, which is uh, terminus of pillows in those five in the septum, which will be attracted to anything. Yeah. And then you have Eurysternus, which is also a herbivore specialized species that colonizes all dung. But we found, for example, Eurysternus, we found it a lot in the human bait, human dung uh, traps. Um, we had a vegetarian in the group, so maybe. <laughs> I was actually wondering how the carcasses and uh, dams differ between the habitats along the gradient because I kind of didn't imagine what is dying or what kind of dance is appearing on the beach. Uh, why there be so different? Uh, are, are there like different? Is there a different diversity of the dance? Yeah. The uh, for example, on the beach, okay. we think that these two species rely mainly on capybara dance that are quite abundant. Well, not quite abundant, but are only found in the beach and not found in the forest. Mm -hmm. So we think that Grunfas and Cantonidia that are specialized uh, beach specialists may be using this resource. Um, but we trap them also with the uh, with our baited pitfall traps. So I think they are using any resource that appears on the beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they can be like this is gonna be the most abundant down in the beach. Yeah. Yes, more questions. Uh, just methodologically, when you talk about 108 and 103 species, what do you tell the species about only morphologically or do you see when you are better? 
uh, 100 and ah, yeah. uh, well we use a lot of different guys like one of the members of the team Alejo is a Colombian expert in that field that have written the guide or the reference key for the Colombian dung beetles. And he was the, the main taxonomist of the group. But sometimes we had to classify them as morpho species because we saw different things between species, but we were not able to find the species. Probably these species are not described yet. But we, um, sorry? Yeah, morphological. Yeah, we wanted to sequence, but it's taking time because we have to send the samples to Canada and they give them back. But yeah, it's only morphological work we use. So maybe the richness is even higher if we use molecular methods. It was very uh, detailed, so uh, very, very easy to understand. So thank you very much once again. So thank you for your attention. Uh, for giving the talk. Yeah, and so next week we will be again with our son here and uh, just to give you those, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.